The following program includes graphic images and mature subject matter intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. When Adam Anhang was murdered on the streets of Puerto Rico in 2005, it got the full tabloid treatment. A Canadian millionaire with a beautiful wife and a high-flying career struck down in a horrific crime. Police believed it was a robbery gone bad and made a quick arrest. But Adam's father suspected something far more sinister, especially when Adam's wife suddenly disappeared. And that began a father's long search for justice, a search that would span four countries and take eight years to unravel a possible conspiracy to kill. It's been nearly nine years since he lost his son, but Abe Anghang still struggles with the language of grief. What sort of a son was he, Abe? Unforgettable. You never get over the loss of a child. There are photos and fond memories of Adam's early years in the family's Winnipeg home. But for Abe and Barbara Anhang, one terrible event overshadows those memories. The night of September 22, 2005, Adam bleeding to death on the cobblestone streets of old San Juan, Puerto Rico. At his side, his glamorous wife, Oria Vasquez Rijos. Probably the hardest thing I'd have to do to that point in my life was to tell Barbara that we had lost our son. It's a story that captured uh, Puerto Rican imagination. Jose Sanchez Fournier, a reporter for Puerto Rico's biggest newspaper, said the murder was the talk of the island. A very pretty woman who, who marries a, a millionaire foreigner, a whirlwind romance. They married and then this like violent murder occurs in old San Juan. You know, it, it, it's, it's like out of a Raymond Chandler novel. Abe and Barbara had no qualms when their son moved to Puerto Rico in 2004. Adam felt the island held great promise. It's a huge, huge tourist uh, attractions there. And uh, it gave him an opportunity to do what he loved the most, and that was to develop property, hotels and condominiums and things like that. Adam was a young man in a hurry. Even as a boy, there was a sense of purpose. He would go to the office with Abe, and uh, Abe would, of course, always be carrying a briefcase, and Adam eventually had his own little briefcase. And he took it to school on the first day of kindergarten, in fact. He took a briefcase to kindergarten? Yes, just because he wanted to be like his dad. That was him. That was quintessential Adam. At 26, he was lecturing at the prestigious Wharton School in Pennsylvania. If you're going to be putting your own money into a deal, you're going to want to know exactly where you're being accurate and where you're lying to yourself. But the confidence he showed as an entrepreneur didn't carry over into his personal life. That was apparent when he met Oria Vasquez Rijos in a San Juan nightclub in 2004. A friend said when Adam started talking about his business plans, Oria was all over him. He was very trusting. He may have been uh, naive in matters of the heart. It's possible. She was a very attractive young lady, very well-spoken, and uh, she was in public relations. She had trained in New York. She knew what she was doing. Did you seem nice? Why not? Uh, on the first visit, first date, you're always nice. Carlos Tirado was Adam's friend and colleague. Adam was raised in a good family. Adam had no street knowledge. He had no way to defend his, himself from what Aurea brought to the table. What she brought to the table, friends say, was a sex appeal that Adam was unable to resist. And they say she knew just how to manipulate him. 
One week after they had uh, a, a fight, she disappeared. She ended up in the hospital and nobody could figure out what happened. She went and had full body liposuction, which is quite dangerous. When he showed up at the emergency room, she, she told him, I did this for you. I did this because I want to look good for you. Within weeks, they were secretly married, but things quickly fell apart. She and her mother alleged that he had made her pregnant. Two, three months later, when it turned out that she was not pregnant, he confronted her because nothing was showing. She then admitted that it had, it had not been true. The marriage was, was fundamentally false, fraudulent, wrong. According to a family lawyer, Adam also felt he'd been misled in their prenup. What did he communicate to you soon after they were married? <laughs> what have I done? That's what he said? I see, so this, 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 was, this, was, this was a mistake. And Adam was determined to fix that mistake. Within weeks of the wedding, Adam left their rented home and began planning a divorce. He even hired a detective to follow Oria. Carlos said Adam was worried about Oria's family and wanted a bodyguard. I came by the office, he says, Carlos, I'm separating from Audrey. I don't know what they might do to me, and I would like to, to, to bring you back into the company as, as my head of security. Were you armed? Yes. So this was serious? He was seriously afraid for his life. In their last phone conversation, Abe felt his son's anxiety. I sensed a change in his voice tone. I had the feeling that uh, something very important was going to happen. Adam was about to finalize their divorce. It would all be settled over dinner at a popular San Juan restaurant, a dinner Aurea had planned. But Adam was uneasy. The night before, he emailed his business partner, Roberto Cacho. I'm a little scared right now, he wrote. Cacho told him to serve the divorce papers and get the hell out of town. But for Adam Anhang, there would be no escape. Next, a widow stands by while the wrong man is jailed for a murder. This young man had no reason to do what he did. The following program includes graphic images and mature subject matter intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. It was a warm September night in old San Juan. A pivotal night for Canadian millionaire Adam Anhang. He was about to end an unhappy marriage with his wife, Oria. So he told his bodyguard, Carlos Tirado, to take the night off. He says, Carlos, uh, I'm going to go out with Aurea tonight. I think I got an offer to finally settle this, this divorce. And he says, well, I can't have you come. Anytime she sees you, she flies off the handle. And I need her to be amicable. And what did you think when he said, stand down? Well, it, it's a mistake. A mistake that would cost Adam his life. A sworn FBI affidavit describes how the night unfolded. Adam and Oria leave the Dragonfly restaurant shortly before midnight. They seem to be arguing. In the shadows, a man waits with a kitchen knife. He follows the couple, picks up a loose cobblestone on the way, and he brutally attacks Adam. Journalist Jose Sanchez Fournier covered the story. The, the man just kept uh, striking him and, and, and stabbing him. One of the witnesses, he said there was an exchange between Aurea and the assailant. After that brief exchange, he pushed her. Now, he's continually stabbing the man and hitting him with a cobblestone, yet he only pushed the woman. The FBI affidavit is even more explicit. It quotes an eyewitness who says Aurea 
did not yell, flee, or attempt physically to stop the assailant. But Adam suspected nothing. The witness heard his last words to Oria, run baby run as he lay dying of a crushed skull and multiple stab wounds, Aurea was taken to hospital. What were her injuries? She had a uh, damaged knee and she had uh, some sort of mus muscular uh, damage to her face. They weren't uh, nearly as bad, of course, uh, as, as Adam's. They were not uh, serious. There was another discrepancy. Aurea reportedly told police the attacker was trying to rob Adam, but no money was taken. It's got to be the worst, most uh, violent and stupidest uh, burglar uh, because he didn't take his wallet. The next day, as Abe and Barbara grieved for their son, they say they heard nothing from Oria's family. There was no contact uh, at all. Uh, they didn't come to the funeral. They didn't come to the funeral? No. I had to negotiate with them to get my son's body released. They were going to dump him into a a grave in uh, San Juan that afternoon. Police, meanwhile, reacted quickly to the murder. When something happens to a tourist or to a Puerto Rican in old San Juan, the police jump all over the, 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 the scene because they don't want that to happen. They don't want Puerto Rico to get a bad rap. Police soon had a suspect in custody, a restaurant dishwasher named Jonathan Roman Rivera. He was convicted and sentenced to 105 years in prison. Oria said not a word at the trial. She was probably the only person in the world who could have stepped forward at that day and said, Judge, you got it wrong. And did she? No. I knew there was a uh, terrible uh, miscarriage. This young man had no reason to do what he did. If you look at it, at that very scene with this very woman, she had every motive in the world. Oria's motive, he believed, was money. As a divorcee, Oria would get a settlement, but as a widow, she would inherit a fortune, as much as $24 million. The very next day, I arranged to go and see the FBI, and I arranged to see the uh, head commissioner, and he said he would open a, a case file, and uh, within days, we're onto it. Abe told the FBI there was evidence of a conspiracy calls made on Adam's cell phone after the murder by Oria and members of her family, something the local police had overlooked. The FBI brought in a dozen agents and charged a new suspect, Alex Pabon Cologne, known as El Loco. He confessed to the murder and had an extraordinary story to tell. He said he'd been promised $3 million to kill Adam. He wrote a letter to Ari and her sister saying, if you don't pay me the money that you promised me, I'm going to the cops. It was a stunning turnaround. The first man charged and convicted of murdering Adam was released after serving eight months. The U.S. attorney in San Juan now had a case, a charge of conspiracy to commit murder for hire against not only Oria, but also against her sister and her sister's boyfriend there was just one problem. The prime suspect had disappeared. Next, how a murdered man's wife hid from the law. The law of Italy says that they will not extradite a fugitive who is fleeing a murder case. Florence is home to some of the world's most magnificent art. An ancient city that draws millions of people every year to its famous Duomo and the classic sculptures. But Florence is more than a tourist favorite. It's also an ideal sanctuary for someone looking to avoid American justice. Oria Vasquez Rijos was living here in 2008 when the U.S. attorney in Puerto Rico charged her with conspiracy to have her husband, Adam, murdered. In Winnipeg, Adam's father, Abe, was tracking her every movement. The law of Italy says that they will not extradite a fugitive who is fleeing a murder case. 
they won't send you back. And they won't even charge you in Italy. So you've got a home run, you got a freebie. You, you're, you're, you're free. Abe was determined to keep Oria in his sights. We hired a private detective in Italy and we, we traced her. We followed her around and we know exactly what she was doing daily. For how long? About four and a half years. Four and a half years, a marathon surveillance. Abe's detective pieced together Oria's new life, her home in the heart of Florence, the people she met, where she ate, her new job as a tourist guide. She even had a new name, Bibi Dominici. Locating her was easy, very easy. We found her within a few weeks. The problem was that the government of Italy's laws could do nothing for us. She was a natural fit in her new career as a tourist guide, smart, attractive, and she spoke three languages. In time, she set up her own agency. But there was a problem. If Oria wanted to stay in Italy, she needed legal residency. To do that, you had to have a husband who was Italian. If you had children who were born in Italy, that would also be very helpful. The detective says he found a pattern of stealth, seduction, and lies. First came the children. In 2008, Oria, her hair now dark, gave birth to twin girls. She'd met the father in a nightclub, and he brought Oria here, to his home in the hills outside Florence, to meet his family. Chiesta mio figlio, che era, ha detto che era una vedova, e basta. Vincenzo Di Stefano learned the truth about his son's girlfriend midway through her pregnancy. È stata scioccante sotto tutti i punti di vista. Io ho detto qui l'unica cosa da farsi è andare dalla polizia che lei scendeva dalle nuvole che non ne sapeva niente. Quindi era tutta una fandonia. The relationship with Vincenzo's son ended soon after. Today, the Di Stefano family is fighting for permanent custody of the couple's two girls. Prima, lei si deve confrontare con la legge. Poi, se la legge non basta, deve confrontarsi con quell'altra legge, che è quella di Dio. Abe's detective then followed Oria to her next stop, Florence's small but tight-knit Orthodox Jewish community. According to some in the community, she told a heartbreaking story. A widow with two girls, a husband killed in a car crash, and no income. She also claimed to be a Jew. I would prefer that this story never happened. Tomas Jelinek manages a kosher restaurant that Oria used to visit. To help a widow, it's a, it's a mitzvah in, in a Jewish world. So everybody was helped widow with two, two daughters. A mitzvah is a commandment from God. The Jews found Oria a place to live, helped her find work, even accepted her girls in a daycare center. And then stories started appearing in the local paper with the headline, Black Widow. Then once you discover that she's not only widow, she's also involved in the fact, it's, it's uh, painful to think that she, she would able to do it. Reporter Giulio Gori wrote one of those Black Widow stories. He met Oria and found a woman full of anxiety. She was very afraid. She was afraid by her father-in-law. She was afraid from FBI. She was afraid from uh, American justice. All people uh, could be dangerous for her. To Adam's parents, it was all part of a carefully crafted plan to gain sympathy. This woman is very, very good at what she does. She has a goal and works toward it. In 2010, Abe's detective made his most striking discovery yet. He followed Oria to a Florentine bank and to its president, Paolo Gallardi. The banker and the widow had formed a deep friendship, one he tried to keep secret. When 16 by 9 tracked him down at his home last month, Gallardi was angry and waved us away. But the next day, he agreed to answer some questions. It was his first and only contact with the media. Perché tutti i media di tutto il mondo l'hanno considerata come una latitante? E vedendo 
l'amore per le bambine, la correttezza che lei aveva con tutti, la dolcezza e questa tenacia di feto, questo amore forte per le bambine, mi rimane difficile credere che possa aver commesso questo. Collardi gave Oria moral support and money. Lots of it. He backed her business, which failed, and later bankrolled her legal costs. It was all a well-kept secret. A volte ci possono essere dei casi giudiziari sbagliati. Non era una latitante, era una persona che viveva alla luce del sole. But Oria was living a borrowed life. A good-looking widow with a good story and friends in high places. It was just too good to last. Last June, Oria took a chance that would cost her her freedom. She flew to Spain, thinking she'd be as safe as she was in Italy. She was wrong. The FBI figured it out. And they, 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 they knew exactly where she was going and when she was going to go and on what kind of passport she was going to go. I have to give them full credit. Spanish police arrested her at the Madrid airport while she was waiting for her luggage. I got a call from them uh, 10 minutes after she landed. My words for her are, you know, your vacation is over, Ari. It's time to come back and face the music. But Oria wasn't done fighting. At an extradition hearing, she swore she was innocent and that she and Adam were victims of the mafia. She claimed she wasn't aware she was wanted in the U.S. The court ruled against her. It ordered she return to Puerto Rico to face trial on a charge of conspiracy to murder. This is a perfect example of where truth is stranger than fiction, I'll tell you. Now, the truth Abe has pursued all this time, the full truth about Adam's murder, may soon be within reach. And what will that moment mean to you all these years later? There's no sense of, uh, of joy. There really isn't because it doesn't take away the hurt and the, uh, the piece of your heart that you've lost. It will satisfy our longing for justice, but it will not satisfy our longing for a son who isn't coming home. Oria Vasquez Rijos is still in a Madrid prison appealing her extradition to Puerto Rico. U.S. authorities have promised to waive the death penalty if she's returned. And if a trial does take place, Abe Anghang says he'll be there. We'll be right back.